Well, thank you all for being here. I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about uh, Calabra and LibreOffice and how we work together and a bit about the company. So we are uh, a small subsidiary of a larger company. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. Um, so the parent company, as you may know, is 150 uh, people, something like that, based in Cambridge, UK, in Montreal. And it's probably the world's leading open source consultancy. I don't know, something like that. And um, we're a subsidiary then, uh, half owned by me, spun out of Sousa in 2013, around 48 people, um, 10 years old this month. So we're celebrating our 10th birthday. It's a little bit after the LibreOffice 10th birthday. Um, and yeah, so, so, but there you go. Uh, we, we, we can't catch up at this point. And we're focused fully on uh, office and online. Um, and we have a simple mission. Um, it's more complicated, actually, when you write it out. But uh, making open source rock is really the punchline. And that's the goal of our shareholders. And if we do that well, hopefully, uh, we're, we're all happy. And that means that uh, when you give us money, typically we invest that in improving the Floss software rather than Lamborghinis. And uh, you know, making LibreOffice better and building our partner ecosystem. And all our code is open source. Um, obviously, we are a business, so we have to make money. Otherwise, you know, it's very hard to uh, pay the staff. Uh, but beyond that, um, it's, it's all good. Um, the parent company, just quickly, does a whole load of cool stuff. Uh, I mean, we're doing cool stuff too, but it, it's different spheres. Let me talk it through. So um, I guess the new, the new areas there, I guess, uh, virtual and augmented reality, there's some, some great stuff there. Uh, OpenXR, so open sourcing and reverse engineering proprietary uh, graphics stacks and virtual reality uh, stacks, and helping to standardize those uh, with open standards. Uh, so there's a thing called Monado that's very popular there. Um, because it's possible that you know, in two years' time, uh, the meta universe will be here and jolly well needs to be open source. So it would be good if it was not Windows only. So there's some kind of strategic uh, work there that's, that's quite popular, getting uh, Linux and open source in cars and boats and ships. And hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Uh-huh. Gabriella is tweaking a knob up there. Fantastic. Uh, all, all that sort of thing. Um, so, so everywhere. But really uh, taking a strategic approach to getting open source in at the bottom of the stack. So if there's a medical device you know, sitting by your bed that goes ping, um, it's very important the Linux is running on it at the bottom. You know? and, and maybe there's proprietary bits on the top. Uh, but you know, we want to help people build those, those stacks uh, you know, uh, well. So the question is then, how do we push proprietariness out of the stack? And well, there are lots of ways. And we talk to lots of people. I'd like to give you one example here, uh, which is the ARM Mali GPU. Now, maybe you've never heard of a Mali GPU. Um, but initially, there was a real problem here. So it ran under Linux, but you'd have a binary blob, which was the driver. And for lovers of NVIDIA, and you, you know, you'd be very familiar with the problem of, of binary drivers uh, in, in Linux and elsewhere. And they basically, they work when you first ship the product, but after a little while, they break. And you can't do anything. You, it, it's just awful. And, and all embedded software people are hating this. So anyway, Calabra invested very heavily in reverse engineering the ARM uh, Mali chipset. Um, and help you know, build this new, now mainline driver um, supports, I don't know how many generations of the Mali chipset. And we did it so well that eventually ARM embraced it as well. And we managed to open this huge binary blob in the core of you know, so many embedded systems. And to give you just an idea, Mali is the world's most shipped GPU. Eight billion devices out there. That's more than, obviously, there are people alive. And we really want to make sure that open source can come from the bottom up and, you know, advance up the stack uh, from the bottom. So really driving openness there. Of course, this is just one of our, our, our group's um, achievements. But I, I, I'm really pleased to see that happening. Now, of course, Calabra Productivity has a different role. We come from the top of the stack down. You know, we are the ultimate leaf node you know, in, the, in the dependency graph. You know, we depend on everything in Linux. And, and so we really need to uh, you know, get, get, get going well on that. Let me start my timer, which is probably uh, worth doing, isn't it? Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, so doing some cool stuff there, but, but starting from the other direction. And hopefully we meet in the middle, and the world is all free software. That's the, that's the goal. Um, so what do we do? Well, um, obviously we have to make money before we can spend it. So uh, we try and sell products uh, that protect people's digital sovereignty, particularly Calabra Online, uh, your own private office in the cloud. And we build that, of course, on top of LibreOffice technology, which we support very heavily. And we sell SLAs and, and you know, all sorts of compliance-based things to make your deployment uh, work and beautiful. We also sell Calabra Office, which I guess is our branded supported version of LibreOffice. 
and we build online on top of that. And we also do consultancy, but we're really not a consultancy company. We do this just to help our product customers really get into uh, all of the goodness. Um, we sell through partners, and we really have a lot of them. There's 235 of them, and these are a few of the ones in our partner council, I guess, who come and uh, we, have, we have meetings with very rather regularly. Um, and, you know, the problem is there are people out there who can just install our Docker image and claim they support it. But, you know, can they? Can they? Really? Probably not. Um, so it, it's really good to make sure you have a, you know, a genuine partner to work with. And, you know, there's some really smart people there, and it's just great to work with them. And that gives Calabra, you know, an amazing language base. So we can, you know, we can talk to people in many languages many, and many countries. And, uh, you know, so, so when people come to our website, they, they end up talking to a partner who understands their issues, we hope. And then we sell stuff for money uh, like that, which is great. Primarily subscriptions, which, which is great. Another thing, uh, just, this is just an example of, uh, of some, some great work getting that into the market, is the Bundesministerium Interior in uh, the federal, the FBI of Germany, has been doing some great work around the Open Desk project with Open Code, um, helping to fund and improve a Calabra Online, uh, along with a bundle of other projects. You can see the logos below, and turning this into a product called Open Desk, or a product, a, a project. Uh, and, and it's just great to, uh, to have them to to fund and work with all of these partners to improve the integration and, and make that much more beautiful uh, together. Uh, so, m so many of these features you'll see here are being funded uh, in part by this, this project. And uh, so we're just really grateful to have you know, uh, a level of funding that allows us to solve some of the longer term problems. So back to the code. And the awesome LibreOffice technology underneath. Uh, so I'd love to uh, give first a whole set of examples of things we've done to make LibreOffice better. And then I'll talk a little bit about some Collabora Online things. But first. LibreOffice technology. So interoperability is a, is a real issue because there are trillions, do the Google searches, there are literally trillions of documents out there in horrible formats and we need to make that better. And so one of these then is, you know, one of the things that stops this is the top writer issue of vast you know, numbers of duplicates, huge numbers of CCs, lots of broken, broken documents. And it's just been great to be able to resource Miklos to work on this uh, for a long time and significantly improve this, uh, particularly for government forms, uh, where for, for various reasons, the UI these days in, in Word loves to float your table. As soon as you try and size it or do anything, it, it, it pops out and turns into this very badly behaved thing. I mean, if you, if you can see, the text is wrapping around the bottom here. Uh, here I am. Oh, I've got a laser pointer, probably. Oh, I could kill someone with it. Second. Aha. Does it kill people? Aha. Yes, can you see that? Um, so you can see there's a nice table here. Uh -huh. And then there's stuff wrapping around the bottom of it here, which is, which is the bit that didn't work before. Um, maybe, that, maybe that's visible. Um, and, and it's surprisingly how, how impactful this is across so many documents, you know. Um, just to give a more uh, pathological example, you can see sort of like corrupted muck all over the, the top of your, your table frame here that really should be, you know, in the next bit down, uh, wrapping around it, as it were. Um, so, and this is the Microsoft uh, uh, implementation there. So, so adding this feature is really very critical. Of course, it's never one feature. It's a combination of a generation of different bits there. But really encouraging to see so many bugs getting closed there and fixed uh, that have been open since open office long ago uh, days. Another thing is compact pivot tables. So I, I heard about this a very long time ago, but Microsoft changed their default for pivot tables a long time ago. And we hadn't caught up, but now we have. So uh, we have, instead of these rather large and uh, cumbersome, ugly ones, we have, you know, smaller, prettier, uh, compact ones. And that really helps for interoperability because pivot tables aren't perfect and people love to use formulae that copy bits of them out to do other arithmetic elsewhere. And that really then relies on the hard-coded layout. So that's really important. A document theming, also very, very important. Uh, and yeah, just, just good to uh, get you know, our wor word, our writer, uh, and Quickie here, who's, who's photographing avidly, is, is responsible for all this good uh, you know, color theming and scheming and uh, uh, storing that. Armin over here doing wonderful multi-stop gradient stuff with Allotropia for uh, uh, rendering uh, better things to make your documents uh, just theme nicely. Now, of course, we could flatten the colors, but we want to uh, round trip them and be able to re-theme documents. Uh, and then just loads of other stuff. I mean. I don't know, what can I say? There should be names on each slide, but uh, 
you know, getting those huge documents to work nicely with Attila on 64-bit zip or uh, in numbering and frame anchoring positioning uh, with, with just in multi-page TIFF import. You know, lots of scanners uh, generate these huge TIFF files that have lots of pages in one file. It would be nice if you could actually see the pages. Uh, so Rashesh just uh, did this. Um, improving the fitting algorithm in Impress, uh, cropping videos are there, and, and improving the ability to, to make the sidebars uh, look nice and lay out properly uh, by simplifying the glade there. Um, Mike Kaganski doing uh, math sidebar <coughs> stuff, making math easier to use. Sorry, I need a drink. Uh, page number insertion. Uh-huh. <coughs> Of course, it was always possible to put a field in, in a header, but it's just nicer if you have a little wizard for the, the simple user that they expect. And making performance better pretty much everywhere. <clears throat> Lots of interest in this. And that's, that's really, really cool. Uh, so, and of course, it's really important for online as well where we have lots of people using the same server. So that's one of the things I love about online. It gives us a, a really good reason to do lots of exciting performance work everywhere and make, make everything snappy and, and, and excellent uh, for everyone. So all of those things are already in LibreOffice. They're already upstream. They're already uh, shipping in many cases. Um, but I'd just like to talk about some of those places where we use LibreOffice technology to get brilliant in-browser collaborative editing. And first off, we got some just obvious stuff, like bringing nice features uh, from, from LibreOffice technology straight to your browser. So to do that, it's not just a matter of showing all those dialogues. Uh, we need to do work for each one of them to make them asynchronous. So it's not just uh, Shubham making this nice, nice feature, but uh, also Darshan doing uh, the asynchronization of it uh, so it doesn't, doesn't block stuff. Uh, we've done a lot of work making uh, bibliographies work really nicely with Zotero, thanks to Pranam. And so you can collaborate on citations, and you can do great, great academia and legal stuff in, in government organizations and so on with uh, Zotero. And um, we've got lots of hyperlink uh, improvements, so you can have nice previews of links popping up as you, as you edit the link. Uh, and I think video, video embedding too, which is, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's really nice to be able to embed that in the, in the sheet and then stream it uh, to the client and uh, make sure your presentation goes uh, smoothly. Uh, font previews and drop downs, so we've done some nice, nice UX things there. Thanks, Shimon, for that. And then lots of memory optimization. So, so one of the great things is that if we can use memory more efficiently, uh, we can save bandwidth, we can send more deltas, uh, we can get more people on a server and more people editing happily. Um, so lots of, lots of work there to improve memory. Um, CPU optimizations as well. Wherever we look, there is a wealth of opportunity for improvement. So, uh, so that's, that's really good. Uh, our forefathers have left us lots of good things to do. Uh, so no, no chance for boredom. And uh, so some great work there uh, from Quaylorn and, and others. Um, we've moved almost our entire UI to using uh, welded dialogues, so based on Quaylon's work at Red Hat there uh, and Shimon's work to make that to work with JavaScript nicely and a whole team of people uh, moving all, all of those to the client side to make them accessible, which is really important, and themable, which is important for accessibility too, and you know, just crisper and easier to Cypress test than our previous pixel uh, dialogues. On top of that, we've been doing a whole lot of work, Marco uh, Cecchetti in particular, in Italy, uh, doing screen reading and helping make the document content itself uh, able to be uh, used with a screen reader and, and navigated uh, through the browser, through a remote WebSocket connection. So there's some quite exciting uh, logic going in there that Marco's been working on. A dark mode, obviously that's been in the LibreOffice core, uh, and we now want to bring it uh, and have brought it to online. Uh, since you have to render differently anyway, you can do things like, hey, rendering pilcrows and spell checking and other different features in different views. So that becomes a per view setting. And we've also brought a very nice navigator to, to the client side here with all sorts of uh, theme, theming buttons and uh, looking very good. So you can, you can navigate those huge documents uh, easily. And you know, online does scale beautifully, as LibreOffice does, to huge documents. You know, I, I routinely use a 300-page document just to test it. You know, editing at the top and uh, moving all of it down as and when I can. So, yeah, all, all my one-to-one -one minutes have, have anonymized ancient stuff in them uh, for this reason, uh, for my one-to-ones with staff. <coughs> what else? Uh, key bindings are really important. So we've got lots of key binding work going on, um, really focused there on the notebook bar and multi-character bindings as well. So, you know, some of these things, there's so many things in the toolbar uh, that, you know, you can't do it with just one key binding. You know, you need like CD for some other thing, A, 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 B, and so on uh, for some of these things, which is quite fun. So, <clears throat> and nice pop-ups there to show that. 
and really a lot more. These are just some, some uh, headlines and highlights of it. But it's just fantastic to be able to work with so many um, cool kids. Uh, this is uh, 12, the last 12 months, something like that. So thank you for all the people uh, that contributed. It's great to work with you and just fantastic to have you as, as an extended part of the team. That's, of course, the, the people that don't work for Calabra, so uh, external uh, people, if such a thing exists, external, internal. And, of course, it's all built with LibreOffice technology, so just uh, that great uh, technical foundation underneath there. What else can I say? Cool days. Well, yes, come. Come and see us. So if you want to find out about uh, Collabora Line, get involved in technology, uh, have fun with, with people, uh, you can see some of the things that we've done here. I think this was skydiving last time. I can't, I, I, in Berlin, actually. Uh, let's see, what time but one ago. Uh, punting, uh, fooling around. Uh, oh, you know, lots, of, lots of good people are there. Uh, there's some recovering uh, people as well, you know, but there you go. Um, it should be great to be there. We, we don't quite know what we're doing this time, but, uh, you know, book, book the date. Hey, wait a minute, where was the date? What was the date? Ah, it was the 8th to the 12th of April. And there's a QR code there if you like such things and uh, you want to find the URL and register now. Uh, you, should, you should definitely do that. So um, last time uh, there was some uh, concern, I think, about some of the things I'd said, um, or maybe the venue for saying them. And so I'm sorry that caused uh, concern in, in my keynote. Um, I think I probably mostly opened my mouth to change feet. However, um, I think it's probably good to sort of uh, build on that with some vicious personal attacks. So I thought I would uh, uh, focus on myself. Um, so, so here we go. Um, so, so for a long time, my emails all came with this very helpful disclaimer in the, in the bottom, you know, that said, pseudo-engineer, itinerant idiot, which basically means, having read my long opinion on, on something in an email, you should probably bear in mind that I could easily be completely wrong, and, uh, you know, this is part of a discussion, and, uh, you know, bring me your feedback, as it were. Um, and unfortunately, um, when I started to get customers with whom I interacted only briefly, and often in my role as trying to sort out some problem, um, they didn't really understand, and it became too difficult to explain them uh, a long period. So instead, I have a boring signature that says, that makes me sound like a posh person, uh, which helps the customers, but perhaps not the community. So I'm sorry about that. I tried to do have both for a long time, but it, I just kept sending the wrong one to the, the right people, and it was, it was bad. So anyhow. This is rather a brief summary of, of my failings, um, so I thought I would expand on that in, in, some, uh, in some detail. So, so I think one of the problems I have is that when, when people criticize me, sometimes I'm like, yeah, that's completely fair, you know, like, obviously. But other times, it's like, oh, that's a bit too close to the bone, you know, I don't, I don't think I agree with that. And when I get on the defensive, you know, when I'm, when I'm uh, attacked, it's very often that I can forget that I have actually lots of flaws, you know? I mean, the other person may be completely wrong, but they may actually have some point uh, to make. And so I think it's just difficult for me to listen to that. And I think if we look at our politics today, we, we see quite a lot of polarization in, in the wider world. You know, like it's, there's way too much of this not listening and ignoring. And I, I'm completely guilty of that. So sorry if, that's, if you're a victim of that, I'm sorry. Um, another thing that I'm particularly uh, annoyed about and looking back uh, retrospectively, I think, is that Anyone who's dealt with Bugzilla uh, knows that there are flaming asses out there, and they, they post horrifyingly rude things in Bugzilla. And if you haven't experienced this, you're probably not a developer, you know? They question your ability, your parenthood, your, you know, how you can possibly write this, and they point out you've lost them all of their software, you know, all of their documents, and how, how dare you live with yourself, and so on. And, and our general approach, I think, as a project has been to laugh this off internally and try and get any good that we can out of the report. Is there some kind of pattern here? Is there some details? Can we, can we calm these people down and, and work with them? And, you know, and actually, in some cases, some of those people have even joined our community, having been calmed and moderated, and it's, you know, it's, it's been a good strategy. Unfortunately, I think I have tolerated that inside our community as a way of discussing with each other for much too long. And I think a, a radical failing of mine was not setting boundaries there and saying, look, if you're going to be a member of this community and part of it, you need to behave in a responsible and respectful way to other people. And otherwise, we end up with toxicity in the community that makes it very hard to communicate and understand each other. And I think I failed to take action on that. You know, it, it takes bravery to stand up and say, this is not okay. 
you know, like this, this email is not, not acceptable, the tone is bad. You know, you can say what you need to say, but you don't have to say it like that. Um, and I think I failed to take action on that at TDF, and I think lots of us have if we look at, you know, look at our discourse. And uh, probably we need to fix that. But look, getting back to me. Another thing I really struggle with is trying to get openness in there, not just for myself, but also for my team. So it takes a constant work to encourage staff to discuss things in public, partly because customer names are involved and project names and they're confidential and, and so on and so on. So it's, it's extra work to discuss in public just because of this. But more, it's extra work because other people might disagree with you. And then you might have to work to, you know, work with them and build a, a bigger uh, understanding and so on. Um, so there's risk involved there. And often I don't think I've done enough to do that myself. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm constantly encouraging my team. So if you're on my team, you know, do more in public. Get, get it out there. Uh, and I think we had some drives to do that, but they're not as successful as I'd like. And we need to be more, more transparent and open. I think... I mean, I could go on for, for weeks here. Luckily, I've only got a few minutes left. Uh, but with my, you know, it's a compendium of my failings. I think one of the things that's particularly irritating to me is, is my, a time perspective mismatch. And some people can contribute to LibreOffice as, as volunteers, and they have lots of time, and they have a very relaxed approach, and they want to discuss everything in great detail. And that helps. That can help get a better quality result, and that's cool. Other people are insanely busy and under cost and time pressure, and this gives a very different uh, time perspective, and that can cause real communication issues. And I've seen that across my career, actually, uh, from, from before I was even involved in LibreOffice. A silly example is that I, I would love to be in lots of talks supporting individuals and uh, my staff and so on at a conference. But there are really at least three tracks. There's the hallway track, you know, and then there's the, the conference tracks. And I can't be in all of them. And it's, it's frustrating to me. And I really love spending time with people. There are so many. I mean, look at you. You know, you're, you're all wonderful. And uh, I, I love to, uh, you know, go deeper and understand and get to know people. It's actually a luxury um, I enjoy. But it's, it, I, I completely fail very regularly to um, negotiate, you know, how much time's there, um, I also speak very quickly. Uh, and so it's quite unfair to people who take time to process and understand uh, what I'm saying. And yeah, just having the patience to listen and trying to get the signal, uh, signal out of that is, is something I, I still don't know how to do this properly. So if you have a brilliant idea, come and tell me. Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. Anyway, there are many more failings I have, but thank you for your patience. Um, against that, I'm really pleased that, the, uh, that Torsten and the board here seem to be doing a really good job of, of working through some of these, uh, these issues and getting help uh, from outside and inside to improve uh, TDF. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. So, so 10 years. I mentioned we had 10 years. Um, open first, open source. This is our headquarters, I guess, for what, for, for it, for what it is. One of the great privileges of my life has been to work with so many talented people. Um, in terms of code contributors, in those 10 years, we've had 75 uh, Calabra coders, there are their names, uh, that, that have contributed to the code uh, and done just the most amazing things. And I've, I've had the great privilege of interviewing perhaps another 150, 200 other people uh, for many of these roles over the time. So that's quite a lot of, lot of time talking to people. And we've loved working alongside, and I, I generated the number, it's something like 1,400 individual code contributors. And I major on code contributors because they're easy to count. There are many contributions, obviously. Um, but the, this, is, uh, this is important. And it's just like 1,400. That's, this really encourages me that we're doing some really good things right uh, at LibreOffice in that time. And then, of course, it's much more than code. You know, we, we couldn't do what we do without the 40-plus people we've also worked with um, alongside for lots of these other vital roles, you know, when it comes to, you know, administration. There's lots of things that need doing, uh, you know, financing, I mean, just sales, telling people every day about LibreOffice technology and trying to get them to, to invest in it, to tie their company to it, to buy it, to deploy it, to get it out there. And there's just a, a great set of people there uh, doing really good things that perhaps many of you will never have heard of or seen. Um, we've done a lot of stuff. Now, commits are not everything. Let me uh, qualify what we're doing with that. But anyway, over 10 years, you'll see that we've contributed really quite a lot. And we're very blessed to have been able to do that alongside 
many others, and the team there. One of the things people often ask is how much of that was funded by TDF, meaning how, to what degree is Calabra actually just the Document Foundation donors under a different disguise? And that's a fair question. Uh, the answer is it's about a 40th of our revenue, and I've tried to put a sort of a little thing there. So if, if revenue turns into commits eventually, or code, then, then it's something like that proportion. So a real proportion, but not, uh, not overwhelming. Um, what else? Well, our customers have filed. I, I, you know, I'm always nervous with this fi customer filed tickets uh, metric. But anyway, they filed something like 3,600 tickets um, as of two days ago, and about 35 of them are currently open. So we closed a lot of issues for our customers. Uh, around 10 every day, uh, if we worked seven days a week uh, for 10 years. And we've paid all of our bills and our contractors, and we've met and paid Sousa's unwritten obligations. You know, when, when Sousa came to me and said, look, we're shutting the team down, and we're, uh, you know, uh, you're not going to work on LibreOffice anymore, that was kind of a wrench for me, because two, three years into LibreOffice, we'd made some pretty big commitments to the project, at least individually. And although there's, there's no legal reason, there's no written agreement to doing that, I think it's really important that Calabra has, in those 10 years, I think, paid off uh, Sousa's uh, bill there and had great fun supporting their, their customers as well uh, through, through that time. Uh, another team, I think, is having an open culture internally. So our salaries are private, obviously. Well, not obviously, but yeah, that, it is so. But pretty much everything else that's possible is open to all of our staff, our financials, our customers, our contract, you know, the whole thing. And we try and have a 100% open culture that makes it easy for people to get all of the information they need to help us make good decisions. Uh, we have weekly management uh, minutes are all published. We have all hands calls, no questions barred, etc. Um, we've had something like 85 million yeah, Docker image pools, which is pretty cool when you consider that's a server that serves uh, others. Um, yeah, around 4 million paying users, something like that. 57,000 commits, 21,000 commits to Collabor Online. Lots of partners. And the partners are vital to our work. We couldn't do anything without our partners. We really prefer not to talk to customers, but to talk to partners. And in case you think this was easy, because some people think it's easy, um, my, my personal record for a, for a working day is 36 hours. It turns out you can do nearly a week of work in, uh, you know, in two days if you just don't sleep and you work back to back to back to meet the deadline and cover for the team and deliver finally what the customer needs in the time they need it to keep LibreOffice technology alive and to keep the project uh, moving forward so that we don't lose key accounts. This makes my hair white and shortens my life, but this is the kind of commitment uh, that we need. Uh, we've also made lots of gorgeous products, uh, so, so the online uh, and tablet as well as collaborative editing um, experience, which you're perhaps aware with, and the story is just beginning. We're still hiring, so you know, if you want to join the team, uh, we have uh, lots of uh, people. We want to expand our testing investment uh, with a senior developer there for testing. Uh, we have room for interns. If you're good at marketing automation, we have lots of uh, optimization of our sales process there. And our parent company has even more roles. If you want to work on open source, if you want to have fun working with other people, uh, just grab me afterwards. So, conclusion. Collabora loves LibreOffice, and uh, we work pretty blinking hard on it. And we do that to deliver our mission, uh, which is to make FOSS rock. Uh, we liberate people's documents uh, by the hundreds of millions, and it's all paid for by our customers and our partners. We can't do anything uh, without them, so thank you if you're a customer or partner uh, and you're watching. Uh, you're wonderful to us and the whole, whole project, and it makes it, it, it all happen. And of course, we can't do that without our staff, so thank you uh, for working hard alongside the community as openly as possible. And uh, economics matters. I have a talk on economics later, I think on Saturday. I'd love to see you there. Uh, we should really use the strengths of our different kinds of organizations and our different locations to work together to deliver the best for software freedom. It's a pleasure to sponsor the conference. Thank you for your patience. Bless you.